Okay, good morning everyone. I hope you had a chance to get a glass of water or a cup of coffee and you're revived uh, for our second session of the day. My name's Michelle Nelson. I'm one of your co-chairs. I'm here with my colleague Vicki. Um, Vicki Clooney from the CVS Inverclyde. We'll talk later, you'll hear us uh, in many other sessions. It's my pleasure to kick off the session today, which is working with community partners. It is live streamed, so we will have questions potentially coming from our international audience. Um, our first speaker of the day is Dr. Lewinchuk. He's um, talking to us about creating a system-wide third sector, which is a topic near and dear to our hearts. So I'm gonna turn it over to you. We will keep track of the questions and and the time, of course, so that we stay on track. Thank you very much, and it's, it's a pleasure to be here this morning uh, with you. I don't know if I have a timer, so I'm just gonna pull out my phone to make sure I don't go over time. Okay, thanks. Um, I'm going to um, speak to you, as mentioned, about creating a system-wide third sector uh, health partnership. So I want to start by saying three things. This is uh, an approach from a big, system, a big systems approach, not a local approach. Number two is that I realize and understand that context is critically important. So this is what works for us in the province of uh, Alberta. And some of these things might give you ideas or maybe you'll give me and give us ideas as well. And the third thing is I'm starting from the perspective of the third sector exists uh, uh, or the volunteer sector, sector. I'll use the two terms uh, interchangeably. Um, if you want to hear about the role or discussion about the role of the third sector, uh, that would be session 3N uh, this afternoon. So why do we as a health system need to work with the third sector or the volunteer sector or why should we? Well, let me ask you this question. What percentage of care do you think is provided by those of us in the healthcare system? Is it 90%, 70% or is it a lower percentage? I suspect you can probably guess the answer to this. The healthcare system probably provides somewhere between three to 5% of care. If you think in our province of Alberta, Canada, the average person sees a family doctor 4.1 times a year for a total of 48 minutes a year. Eight out of 1,000 people in Canada end up in a hospital. So you can see we don't supply the majority of care. Family caregivers in Canada and the United States provide about 24 to 25 hours a week. So you can see who provides care. Um, it's not only family caregivers and self-care where the care is provided, but if we look at a formal care system, so 90% of informal of care is uh, somewhat informal, 10% formal. Of the 10% that's formal, 70% of that is provided by the third or the volunteer sector. So in our province, about 33, a third of the population volunteers, uh, and that uh, varies across the world. Um, but that means that there's about 12 volunteers for every healthcare worker. So I think we're getting to the point of why we should be working with the third sector. Our province has 26,000 not-for-profit volunteer and charitable organizations, 175,000 people employed, and it provides $9.6 billion of monetized economic benefit, which is about 60% roughly equivalent of the healthcare budget. So I think that alone would answer the question of why it's uh, important for us to work with the third sector. Globally, if you look at the number of not-for-profit volunteer and third sector organizations, uh, in our province, it's one organization per 176 people. And it's a fairly sim uh, similar number across the world. You see we're very close to the numbers uh, in Ireland and in the United States. Uh, these numbers are very, can be, some of them are dated and some are from, from uh, questionable sources, but pretty much a, a fairly similar representation. So getting back to why we should be working with the third sector, well, again, your country, no matter where you're from, probably has 10 times more volunteers than it does have healthcare workers. And most volunteering, the biggest majority of volunteering actually occurs in relation to health provision. 
This audience, I don't have to tell this audience that we know that the majority of health outcomes are actually related more to social factors and social determinants than they are necessarily to direct medical care. And no country in the world, in no country in the world, does the government supply 100% of those social care uh, factors. Uh, and in no place in the world does the community provide 100%, hence the need for a third sector or a volunteer sector to fill that gap. From a different perspective, the World Health Organization tells us that about 80% of uh, healthcare costs are due to chronic disease, and we also know that most chronic disease uh, is also affected by social factors, hence it brings it back to the need of the volunteer sector. So how do we in our province work with the volunteer sector? Well, we have a number of rules or principles that we use. Number one and the most important for us is that we give up power in order to gain power. What we're really saying is that in healthcare systems, we like to be in charge. It's our rules, our templates, our way of doing things, the outcomes that are important to us, you know, like save money and decrease hospitalization rates and uh, visit rates to the emergency department, we have to throw that out and realize we're just one of a number of partners. And when we do that, amazing things happen. Pillar number one of integrated care is a shared vision. And if we can agree between the third sector, the volunteer sector, and the health sector, what is our vision? What is success look like to us? What does paradise look like to us? That gets, sets us on the right road. So having a shared vision and a current understanding of the, of the current state, really pillars one to four of integrated care has been shown to be, it really works well uh, for us. And then of course we need a mechanism in which to collaborate and the way in which we do that in our province, I'll talk a little bit about later, but we need some sort of organization or structure and way in which to work with each other. You can imagine that in our province with 26,000 third sector entities, uh, it's impossible to work with all 26,000. In England, I'm told, or the statistics or the very reliable internet tells us there are 186,000 volunteer or third sector organizations and surely England cannot work with 186,000 uh, organizations simultaneously. The other thing is that, as I said at the beginning, it's important that it's not just what's important to the healthcare system, but what's important to everyone. So we want to make sure that there's a mechanism uh, in order to make sure that all the stakeholder needs are being met. And often we don't think of what all the stakeholders are. Yes, it is the patient or the person, the family, the healthcare system, but it's also the government, the local government, uh, local businesses, for example, the local population, all have an interest in particular initiatives that we may be undertaking. Uh, again, number five is making sure that the relationship is, is balanced, uh, works for us, is that we take into account and make sure that the needs of the third sectors uh, are being addressed and check in with them to see if we're meeting their needs. Uh, and that links to what we found that is we um, we saw Maslow's, or Maslow's pyramid, which I don't believe personally is a pyramid, I think everyone's is important, but uh, issues of, uh, of self-actualization and appreciation uh, uh, apply to organizations as they much to individuals. Uh, during COVID, we had tremendous help from the third sector, and we certainly realized that they helped us, we helped them, so we advocate on their behalf to funders, on their behalf to government, We've written articles, for example, in the Rotary International Magazine saying what a great help our third sector has been uh, to us. And so that helps us to, to help them as well. Number seven talks about third sector volunteer agencies are made up of humans and often we take the third sector for granted. We ask them to do things without realizing what their capacity might be. We're learning and understanding that the third sector is no different than anywhere else in the healthcare system, uh, that they are experiencing the same sorts of challenges. After COVID, the number of volunteers is tending to fall. The greatest proportion of volunteers tend to be the newly retired, and that also translates, though, to the baby boomers. And the baby boomers are aging and now needing care themselves, are in less of a position to volunteer. So there's the volunteer sector or third sector is facing those challenges. The other thing which is happening globally is that people are less willing to commit. I don't want to commit to volunteering every Wednesday afternoon. I want to volunteer when it's convenient for me. And that's a challenge for the third sector. They're having to adapt 
uh, to that change, um, in, sorry, in, uh, uh, in volunteering. So we got to... And the other thing is that not every problem necessarily requires us to create yet another volunteer uh, agency. There's a lot that can be done by way of informal volunteering and organizing and, and coordinating local informing volunteering at a community level. Well, as I mentioned, we're I'm, I, I, speaking about this from a, a large system perspective. Our province of Alberta has about 4.6 million people, so we're roughly tiny bit smaller, for example, than Denmark, Ireland, or New Zealand. So that's the type of size of system that we're dealing with. So we can't deal with 26,000 not-for-profit, volunteer, and charitable, or third sector organizations. So how do we go about doing that? Well, we use the principle of we do provincially that which makes sense to do provincially. So for example, an example that everyone might understand is the Red Cross international organization, if there's a disaster, we would deal with, of course, local groups, but with uh, a provincial level group. So we deal with provincial level groups where it makes sense to do so. At a one level down, we have five zones in our province, so we deal zonally with those groups where it makes sense to deal zonally, and then locally, which is very important, we do locally that which makes sense to do locally. So we don't try to be top-down, do everything provincially, but we try and balance provincial uh, and uh, local uh, as, uh, as well. We tend and we find that it's, it's helpful. There are umbrella organizations, as we call them, that exist, groups that are uh, oversee or our co-op or groups of the volunteer agencies. So in Canada, we would have something called the United Way, which funds a whole host of uh, uh, organizations. I mentioned the Red Cross as an example. We have a provincial agency, which represents and advocates on behalf of all of the volunteer uh, organizations. Uh, organizations which exist across the province, such as the, the service clubs like the, the Rotary Club, which I mentioned, which is also, of course, an international organization. So we find that we're cascading down through those umbrella organizations. They use their connections to uh, interact zonally, and they then interact at a local level. So we found that that's what uh, works for us. We've had really, really, really good experience in working with the volunteer sector. They're incredible uh, 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 people who are really, really willing to, to do the right thing. Us providing feedback and helping them understand this is how your work has benefited us and has benefited the people that you help. We found to be very helpful uh, as well. So hopefully uh, you've taken away some uh, nuggets of uh, information uh, from from this, uh, just conclude by saying that uh, quite often as a healthcare system, we provide and think we're providing care the noun. It's a thing. What people really want is care, the verb, somebody to care for them. And we find that the third sector really helps us in providing that care. Thank you. Um, we have a, we set up a, a committee. The solution in the healthcare system is if you don't know what to do, set up a committee. So we set up a committee, but this committee is one that has e of equality. There's, it's accountable only to each other. And once a month we get together and we talk about what our, we literally ask about what our shared vision is. So we, we try in the healthcare system not to say this is what's important to us, this is what we need your help with, but we also say what's important to you, what are you hearing, what, how can we help you? And that seems to work very well to have that, that group where they're, we're only accountable to each other.
Yeah, <laughs> yes, but I'm going to be skating on, on a little bit of thin ice. Absolutely, we hear exactly what you say, that so much of the time and effort is occupied in getting next year's funding uh, in order to do good, good things. We found in our province, I'll speak only about us, uh, and you can see if it applies, but a lot of the measurement is transactional. How many meals did we deliver? How many clients did we serve? And we don't really ask what were the outcomes. And in our social, in our government, in the social agencies, they're introducing uh, a different framework or a different way of looking at things is what have the actual outcomes been? And if we look at that, take things from that perspective, it helps us, it provides a whole series of natural experiments of what types of programs work under what context and what circumstances. And when we understand that, it helps the government and other funders because we have other larger organizations that raise money and then give it to other third sector partners uh, to know where, where's the money best spent, what's the best use of our resource, basic you know, value-based care or value from the perspective of the, of the third uh, uh, sector. Um, every group exists for a purpose. Uh, I've learned all my lessons in life the hard way by mistakes. And so I've said in our city, the city that I live in, we have 78 different groups providing food services. And I said, well, that's, there's got to be inefficiencies there. It doesn't make sense, but my friends in asset-based community development tell me, no, that's maybe a good thing because that they're local. They understand the people they are providing, the verb care, not just a service. So it, there's that bit of, a, uh, of attention and uh, of tension and how we allocate resource across those. I, I don't have the magic answer to, but those are some of the factors and variables I think that come into play. Hello? Okay. Oh, excellent. Here we are. Hello. Um, excellent. Now we have um, Emily here to speak to us about um, Citizens in Charge. Thank you. Yes. Okay. Wow. Um, do I have to speak? Yeah, I have to speak in this. I'm a bit uh, flabbergasted by all the uh, technology, but... Okay, thank you. Um, so good morning. Thank you so much for your presentation. It was like uh, really uh, backed up uh, mine, so <laughs> that's nice. Um, I will focus today on the important role of citizens in the development of an inclusive caring society. And today I'm here to speak uh, on behalf of Burgers Z. Uh, Burgers Z is, uh, it's like uh, four voluntary organizations or four uh, third sector organizations that uh, all work with the help of uh, volunteers. Uh, they all four have a very strong vision um, on the added value on volunteers. So it's, oh yeah, I have to click. Is it this one? Where do I have to click? I'm clicking it. <laughs> yes. Clicking it again. Ah, this one. And there are two green ones. Okay. Um, <laughs> so uh, we are a partnership of, of four third sector organizations that work with, uh, with volunteers and have like a strong vision uh, of the added value of volunteers. So we not only work because volunteers are like extra hands, that's, so we don't have to do certain things, but because they have like a really added value. So you can see the four organizations. Um, well, and they also work with, uh, most of the time, with people in very vulnerable situations that are in need, often in need, of care or assistance. So this partnership wants to disseminate their expertise in setting up all kinds of caring um, initiatives, starting from citizens for citizens. So, and letting people in charge of their own lives, uh, their own care and their own assistance. 
So, um, ah, yeah. In my presentation, I will, uh, I, pre I will present to you the development of a citizen's platform in the primary care zone of the Flemish Ardennes. So Burgers ANZ, uh, the third sector organization, was asked to facilitate this uh, platform. And I will hope I will get at point four, because I had an interview with one of the citizens of the platform. So if you can uh, say uh, uh, at, uh, it's about three minutes, uh, so when my time is like uh, almost up, if you can uh, sign me. Yes, then I will go straight to that one, because I really want to share his experience uh, of the platform. So, um, as, an as an introduction, I will sketch to you what a primary care zone is here in Flanders. Um, as you can see, uh, Flanders is subdivided in like 60 different primary care zones. And a primary care zone is like a network of caregivers that exchange information, uh, experience, and they try to work more coordinated. Uh, and this, of course, to improve the quality of, um, of care. And the Flemish Ardennes, you can see the, the blue zone, uh, that is the Flemish Ardennes. And it is uh, coordinated of, or governed by a care council. So in short, this care council is at the, that makes the, deci the decisions. They're like at the steering wheel, so to speak. Now this care council consists of caregivers, doctors, psychologists, pharmacists, representatives of healthcare organizations, policy makers. So most of them are like professionals. And then, there are like two seats. Um, I'm not really coordinated, but then there are like two seats, or sometimes three. It depends on the population of that zone. Uh, two seats for citizens. Um, and they're like, they have the responsibility to represent the voice of all the citizens uh, in that zone. So, these two or three citizens sit around the table with like 80 professionals um, and the primary care zone in the Flemish Ardennes, they noticed that their voices were not really, yeah, were not always heard and that the professional dynamic often took over. So um, the stories of these citizens, yeah, they, they didn't have the necessary time and space to tell their stories. And as you can imagine, yeah, these care councils have like a very strong professional meeting culture with an agenda, a certain way of making decisions, uh, a certain way of talking. Uh, also, the pace is like very fast. Uh, there have to be results, et cetera, et cetera. And these meetings often take place on times and places when professionals are available and at places that are attainable for them, mostly by car. Um, so as you can see, there are a lot of challenges uh, for citizens to participate. So um, in search to do differently, the primary care zone of the Flemish Ardennes, they formed like a citizen's platform. Uh, and they asked Burgers ANZ to facilitate this program. And the purpose was to provide more space and time for citizens to think about themes that are like really important to them and how to co-create and um, the integrated primary care zone in their region, how it could become more person-centered, bottom-up instead of top-down. Um, so, and the, um, the staff of the primary care zone, they, yeah, they formulated some challenges uh, in advance. They were worried about uh, a few points. And it was, first was, from how are we going to reach like a really diverse group of people? And it was important to have this diverse group of people because yeah, often people that are in a vulnerable situation, that are the people that are not often heard. So we needed to get those people. Um, and they are often in need of care or assistance. And then the staff, they, they understood quite well that it was like very difficult in their position, staff member of the primary zone, to coach this process because they would be too much at the steering wheel. And they were afraid that the process would become too much like top down. Um, and they really wanted to create like citizen ownership. So that is why they wanted to work with like a third sector organization, like Burgers Anzet. Because we had a more not neutral position, 
but we could mediate uh, more uh, or better. Um, so the, in their view, we're, we were also more adequate to facilitate this process uh, because we were not staff members of the primary care zone, of course. And then they wanted to have more input from citizens. Um, they wanted to have like uh, a broader view on what citizens wanted and needed when it came to care. But then they said to us, we don't really want too many specific individualistic stories. You know, we want those citizens to represent the common interests of citizens. Now that is a very difficult challenge because you ask specific citizens to tell their own story um, with their own needs, with their own lives, to become like a representative of other citizens. And at that point, you like deprive them of what they are good at, namely telling their stories, their own lived experience. Um, and we wanted to create space for those stories exactly in the citizen platform. So there was a bit of a, a contradiction also in the expectations. But we, um, we did something with that. So uh, it brings me to the starting points of Burgers Z uh, and how we try to work with these challenges. Um, I don't know if I have time to address them all, but I will choose a few. Six minutes, okay. Um, so I will start with the importance of like meeting each other, um, getting to know each other in the platform, taking time for that. Like in the first meeting, uh, we had, we created lots of space for those people to meet each other, to get to know each other better. So we had speed dates, uh, we had a world cafes concerning questions like, what is a good life for you? Uh, what does it mean to take care of each other? That kind of questions. Um, and people, yeah, shared their stories. And the process of getting to know each other, it takes a lot of time. And it slows down, like, the process of getting content-related results but it was like the foundation of the group, that they felt good with each other, uh, that they could share, and that they could work together. Uh, so, and it also gave them the feeling that they were like heard, acknowledged, uh, appreciated. So we really took a lot of time for that. And not only in the first meeting, but in all the following meetings, we created uh, time to meet each other. We ate together, we, we, we took it slow. So comparing this to the, the dynamic of the care council, you know, with all the professionals and the, the two or three citizens, yeah, there was no time and space for that kind of slowing down. Um, but it's really like a, a point I want to stress. Um, so here you have some photos of the, uh, the first meeting. We, worked, we also, also worked with visual, visualizations of the... Uh, the meetings from what people said, uh, how, yeah, that we had like a, not a, a meeting report, but like really these, these pictures. Um, and then I will, um, I will say something about the importance of stories. So we created this foundation where people could share and could listen to each other. Um, and as, as I said earlier, like the staff was really afraid that people would like get stuck in their own uh, individualistic stories uh, and that it would not represent the common interests of uh, citizens. Well, in this context, in the context of the citizen platform, um, people telling their stories uh, about their lives, uh, about the care that they need or receive or don't receive, is like their power, is like their strength. So if we ask them to represent a whole group, um, yeah, then we deprive them of their, of their strengths, of their power. Uh, we don't want them, in, in this case, to become like representatives or semi-professionals that would have the skills of a professional that yeah, takes all the information and, and talks about it with certain distance. No, we, we wanted to have their experience and their stories. So we decided together with, with the group to install like a forum. A forum, I think it's, you say that in English too, like a sort of speaker's corner. Um, and every meeting we would start with time and space to share your story or to share uh, something that had happened in your neighborhood or your network. Um, so a place where you could share and where teams regarding care could be explored. And pe people told like very different stories, sometimes very disturbing stories uh, about things they experienced. And then in clustering these stories together, certain topics and ideas started to develop. 
and we made a sort of like a, a bucket list of all these teams uh, where we could work on. Three? And then it's, then I have to stop, or then I can show the video. Okay, and then I'm finished. Ah, oh, it's too bad. Well, <laughs> I'm going to show you the, um, the story of uh, a citizen of the platform, uh, because I think it's also uh, very important that not me, I'm giving the, uh, the lecture here, but that you can hear also the experience of, um, of a citizen. Uh, but then I have to search for it. This one's it. So it's he, Janssens. He's a committed, very committed citizen of the platform, and he will share some insights of the of the platform. Of the 200 that we met three in the first peloton, have too many sichtbare of the real, actual zorg and understanding in the van de burgers. From the peloton, konden we wel voorstellen en projecten doen. Maar sloten deze voorstellen wel echt bij de zorgvraag van de burgers zelf aan. En om dat zeker te weten, hadden we de burger nodig. In mijn ogen is het meer dan gat verwacht. En de sterke uitbouw door de medewerking van RUS heeft ervoor gezorgd dat het burgerplatform body kreeg. Ik hoorde op een avond een deelnemer zeggen, deze avond was goed, zo werkt een burgerplatform. Ik kom nog. De cluster p of de groep p is van drie personen naar een groep van 23 personen groot geworden. Van de kleinste groep in de eerste lijn zone van Amsterdam zijn we met voorsprong, met grote voorsprong, nu de grootste groep geworden in de eerste lijn zone van De betekenis voor mij dan toch is het contact, ontmoeting, samen zaken ondernemen met burgers uit verschillende leef. Beroepen, arm, rijk, geletterd, ongeletterd, oud, jong, gezond, minder gezond enzovoort. Als wij via dat burgerplatform elkaars leefwereld beter gaan begrijpen, gaan wij volgens mij ook uh, beter voor elkaar kunnen gaan zorgen. En daarom vind ik dat burgerplatform heel, heel belangrijk. Ik moet ook denken aan, aan een uitspraak van Gandhi. Hè? Gandhi zei ooit, hè, alles wat je voor mij doet, zonder mij... Doe je tegen mij. Ik denk, daar zit ook alles in wat we eigenlijk in het burgerplatform willen. Hè. De mensen betrekken eigenlijk. Hè. Want ja. we, we kunnen niet voor andere mensen denken. Ja, mijn grootste bezorgdheid is dat er nu te weinig, te weinig ontmoeting is tussen, tussen de deelnemers. Mijn tweede bezorgdheid is, ik zou graag zien dat de zwakkeren in onze maatschappij eens het stuur in handen zouden mogen. Want ik denk echt, als wij eh, elkaar beter gaan leren kennen als, als burger en, en van verschillende leefgroepen, dat wij ook veel meer zorg voor elkaar kunnen dragen. Je kunt met drie personen in de pezon niet het ganse landschap of niet het deel waar je verantwoordelijk voor bent overzien. Daarom vind ik eh, de platform een heel, heel mooi initiatief. I think building on your talk, um, the, the next two speakers are co-presenting and when I was introducing our, when we were introducing ourselves to them, they introduced themselves as the two Phillips. So the two Phillips are going to take the stage, introduce themselves and talk about uh, developing partnerships with the local community.
Hello everyone. I'm uh, Friede Keersmaker and um, I'm a volunteer patient representative uh, with the organization of Eulen Spiegel, which is an advocacy organization for people that uh, are in patients in mental health care. And yeah. I'm also a volunteer at Opgewek Tienen. Sorry, Philip. Hi, everyone. I'm the, the other Philip. I work for uh, SAMO, that's a poverty organization, and I'm the chairman of Opgewek Tienen, that's a citizen uh, movement in Tienen, a small town in Belgium. To the left on this slide, you can see uh, well, basically the story of my life maybe, but the ultra short version. Um, things kind of, well, there were good times of course, but things kind of went downhill largely for a large part of my life. And I hit about rock bottom around 2014 um, and then I I stayed in a hospital for a lot of the time, um, for for the better part of two years. Um, and then uh, in that hospital, I started the process of recovery, and which is what brought me here, what brought us here. Um, I'm going going to tell you the story about Tina. It's a small uh, industrial town, 35,000 people, so a lot, uh, a small town, uh, and um, through the ages it it's always a, a wealthy uh, town, but um, beginning of the 20th century, a lot of the industry went away, a lot of poverty, a lot of employment, uh, and people uh, don't believe anymore in uh, the town itself, in uh, engagement, uh, a lot of the social uh, work and social commitments uh, uh, vaporized uh, and the church you see is a little bit uh, symbolic for the city 20 years ago um, partly demolished uh, not uh, a lot of connections anymore and um, there was a, a monastery in uh, our town on this slide you can see uh, what we in uh, mental health care uh, understand under the term uh, recovery or growth. There's uh, four components to recovery. Um, in the middle, most important is the personal recovery. And then there's also functional, clinical, and social recovery. Um, when you're in a hospital, a mental health care, a mental health hospital, um, you're mostly in, in the gray zone. Um, it's clinical recovery, functional, uh, very basic stuff uh, that you're trying to rebuild. And um, you're developing, well, you're kind of finding finding a, a new personality, a new identity. But, and all these all these elements actually are, uh, are linked to each other. If you work on one, you're probably gonna improve the others as well. And an essential one for me really was the, the social, uh, social recovery. And when you're in a hospital, there is of course a social part. You're, you've got group therapy, there's a lot of social stuff, but uh, you could, compare it to a kind of splendid isolation in the hospital. Um, and uh, everything uh, everything is uh, given to you. I mean, it's, yeah. of course, you have to work hard there also, but um, you're, you're isolated from the rest of the world. And uh, for me, um, an essential part in my recovery was getting out, working myself out of, out of that gray zone and out uh, into, into uh, into uh, yeah, the, the, the real world, uh, the social recovery, connecting with, um, with, um, um, with society, with, with uh, organizations and activities outside of the mental health care sector. And for me that meant um, one of the things that I started doing was being, uh, becoming active as a peer support worker which is both inside the mental health sector and, and, uh, and outside, and also as a patient representative. And I started doing sports. I did a lot of sports in a hospital, but it's totally different from doing sports outside. I mean, stigma is really still a big thing. And um, Philip? Um, so with Opgrecht Tine, uh, we try to um, get citizens' involvement, uh, and so we met on a good 
summer day, I guess. <laughs> yeah. um, so uh, Opgewektina tries to um, involve people in neighborhoods. So we uh, do um, gardening. Uh, we also have uh, heritage projects. And what we do is we try to uh, get involved with all the people, but uh, always try to be inclusive. And we all only have uh, volunteers. Uh, so the big um, commitment of them is uh, not to be uh, underschat, hoe zeg je dat? Under underestimated, yes. Um, so and we uh, uh, get started in 2009 and we're now with uh, 150 volunteers. Yes, because mind you, we're, we're trying to condense a 10 year process into 10 minutes. <laughs> Good luck to us. Um, so as Philip said, one day we met, actually I was in uh, my place uh, trying to, to help the neighborhood. I live in a social neighborhood, there's quite some work there, and that's what Philip used to do um, back then. And, uh, but Philip, he has more than one hat, as he already said, uh, also in uh, Opgewektieren, and he, he said, you know, well, maybe, maybe volunteering could be something for you. And, um, and luckily, I accepted, and I was a really shy volunteer in the beginning. Um, and I, yeah, I kept my mouth about, you know, my personal situation because that's uh, difficult uh, to, uh, the confrontation. But um, I met Pantin, which is an open space actually for neighborhood citizen, uh, citizens initiatives. I helped, uh, I mean, uh, do the, fix the interior uh, for this new place that we have now in Tienen since about, let's see, uh, six or seven years. Yeah. Philip? Uh, and Pantene is an, an open space. And open for us is, um, is a critical one because we are open for everyone. But of course, uh, when we have meetings, for instance, it's a bar, uh, Pantene, in the, in the station. When we have meetings, sometimes uh, 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 travelers uh, stop and start participating in the, in the meeting. Uh, we have uh, no costs, activities are free. Uh, we have uh, we work together with, with lots of social or organizations who uh, bring people to uh, the meeting place so it's um, it's an inclusive uh, group of uh, people but still it's not diverse but i will uh, explain that later on so it's a safe space for a lot of uh, vo uh, volunteers for a lot of people um Ah, sorry. No, no, you no, no, no. <laughs> um, and a safe space is also um, uh, uh, comfortable for uh, a lot of people. So when you have the same group of people with uh, peers, it's uh, yeah, it's a s it becomes a safe place to uh, bring your own story to commit uh, uh, into the into the group. Yes, and we also. It's an inclusive space, uh, started from the beginning with, with what, what is called suspended coffees. Uh, so people can buy a coffee for somebody else um, that has to, yeah, that can come into the bar. People that don't have, don't really have money. Does everybody know? Uh, raise your hands if you know it, if you don't know it. Otherwise, maybe I'm, okay, well, thank you. Well, there's still quite a, people, quite a few people that already know the system. So we have that, and there's a spirit of openness. Um, everybody is welcome, even when we're uh, gathering, when we're having meetings. Um, exp well, except when they're um, when they're highly classified, but that's uh, quite limited. Then, then, then anyone can just uh, come in and uh, and have a drink. Um, and we're also a breeding ground for new initiatives. Actually, well, today at six o'clock we have a meeting there to see what we're going to do in the future because we might not be able to stay there for much longer in that space. Um, but also, for instance, I started there as a shy volunteer and then a couple of years later, well, actually uh, four or five years later, there were the, the inundations the in, in Wallonia. Here in, the, in, a, in a another part of Belgium, uh, there was a, yeah, a lot of, um, uh, there was a big flood actually and people needed help. And then because I, I, I I had, by then I had a really big network um, yeah, in Opgewektieren and I was able in just a couple of days uh, to, uh, to, to organize um, a helping event actually, uh, aid for, uh, so we, we, we assembled a lot of, we, we 
a lot of uh, material uh, material uh, things uh, for people over there and we brought them there with in small trucks um, and it's I mean uh, there's no way that I also did a poetry day over there and there's no way that I could have imagined doing these things like when I was in the hospital I mean it's uh, it's 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 incredible what what doors open when you open a door and then there's new doors and when you get when when you get help and support and of course also from the people in the in the caring community uh, that 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 kept uh, that I kept in uh, contact with of course it's amazing uh, that, that was the wrong button sorry okay. So a little bit faster now. So the same church from the beginning, it's uh, above. We um, celebrate our hometown once a year with a, a big city festival. And it's, uh, it's still a, a community story. It's not a program with big artists uh, visiting our hometown. Uh, and also we have an, um, um, a neighborhood competition um, with, uh, I'm not going into details, but uh, people wearing a sheep uh, on their back because uh, we have the name um, sheep hats. I, I don't know how you, <laughs> how you explain that. Uh, it's on the flag of the city. Uh, and we have different groups uh, in, uh, in the neighborhoods making their own sheep, a lot of ages uh, 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 run with them. Uh, and um, yeah, we also have uh, a, a musical group um, uh, with people in poverty uh, making their own story and bringing their own uh, story by music and theater. Yeah, I'm actually a volunteer in that group to the right up there. Um, yeah, it's an organization uh, for people that that, um, that um, um, yeah, well, well, I don't know. <laughs> that, that are in poverty or that, uh, well, the organization tries to give the people in poverty a voice. That's, uh, that's what it does and then they, they have that activity. Um, and 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 what we do on the on the on the city holiday uh, every year is we, we try to actually connect to these groups to, to groups of people that are that are vulnerable and so that's also a matter of, of integrating uh, as much of the community as possible and here by the way is my daughter running and that is our team okay and we did not win we became fourth and they were third so it's good for her <laughs> sorry Uh, very quickly, maybe, there is again uh, uh, Pantine, um, the connection with care, the person sitting over there and, and giving everyone an opportunity to tell about their own story is sitting right here in the room, Peter Dirik. Yes, and he will also have a session about quarter making, so I will not say any more about that. By the way, the session uh, of... Uh, <laughs> Dag is also uh, very connected to that. Um, and we're also trying to, to build a neighborhood help network now in Tienen. Um, some challenges. There's uh, the, I already talked about the challenge of stigma, eh, where, I, where I chose to, to actually not, uh, not talk about anyone. You know, only years later in that same, in that thing that, no, I cannot, uh, I cannot go back apparently. In, the, in the, the slide you just saw there, I talked for the first time about uh, about my situation. Um, another challenge is um, the yeah diversity. Yes. It's we work with a lot of bridge figures and with uh, organizations, but still it's very difficult to make it a, a mixed group. We have diversity in uh, background, in uh, poverty, in uh, but with uh, people of color, uh, it's it's still a, a difficult way for us. But somebody told me from uh, she was a refugee from. Um, uh, Syria, that uh, the, um, the concept of free time is a typical Western um, concept. A lot of, um, we organize our so social life, but in a lot of parts of the world, it's more or less um, bottom up. And um, yeah. Okay. And we're a group of about 150 people, the volunteers. There's a lot more people involved, of course, in activities, but 150 volunteers. Um, there's group dynamics. There's bound to be uh, conflicts. Uh, um, so and uh, yeah, and uh, help is therefore yeah is always welcome because a lot of um, initiatives in your own hometown, uh, there are a lot of uh, initiatives like like ours, seek help, seek uh, volunteers, 
and those are the uh, the networks that are uh, could be very useful for uh, yeah patients for instance um, and of course yeah don't take over because uh, yeah uh, citizen movements uh, stand on on their uh, autonomy and there's many other ways maybe uh, that the caring organizations can help um, with the group dynamics for instance but as Philip said don't take over please so uh, the main takeaway messages of our uh, uh, presentation uh, are to be open um, and look around look around what what uh, what is being organized what citizens are doing uh, in 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 uh, in uh, your town um, and to yeah and try to connect and find the small initiatives in a lot of neighborhoods there are very small initiatives with a couple of people and try to get them involved try to talk to them and try to find out if they're open to be an inclusive um, uh, initiative. Mm. Um, Sometimes in your organization could also be that you're already connected and you don't even know it. Uh, you can have an organization with 50 people, 100 people, maybe 10 or 15, whatever of them are already volunteers in organizations and you, so you're, you're in fact you're connected and you don't even know it. You could turn that into a win-win situation. Um, but get involved yourself, uh, participate uh, in town, uh, become a volunteer, pick a hat. We have, I mean, a lot of hats now. <laughs> this one also. And uh, last but not least. Yeah, empower others and uh, be a bridge for yourself. Yeah. Thank you. And I, and I forgot, wait a moment, I forgot the most important thing because, yeah, it's very, very important. We're always looking for volunteers. And 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 um, some of the best volunteers actually are in in uh, come out of care or they go into care afterwards. Huh? And one of them is standing right here because without him, without Philippe, I wouldn't be standing here. And uh, well, thanks, Philip. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I'm going to close the questions for the interest of time, but there's already a couple that are coming in through the okay. poll, so I will call upon you at the end. But thank you so much for that really lovely sharing of your experience, the vulnerability, and helping, being, helping us be inspired to honor and work from lived experience. So thank you for that. Thank you. Over to you. Thank you to the two Phillips. And um, if I can do a shameless plug, um, I'm going to be speaking this afternoon about the work that we've been doing in, um, on stigma in an area of high deprivation. So it would be great to have a chat with you later about that. So um, 4 o'clock, I think, in the Queen Elizabeth Hall. Now, moving on through, um, our next speaker is um, Dr. Gumendi from the University of Johannesburg. Welcome. I think this might come in handy. Um, what time is it? Morning, everyone. Uh, I hope it's not showing that I'm nervous. I stand in front of a class about 90 something students every day of my life as a lecturer but I still can't get used to public speaking <laughs> so I yeah <laughs> so I hope it doesn't really show and yeah I can't wait for me to finish but I hope you enjoy this presentation <laughs> well, we're looking forward to your talk okay <laughs> and I hope you enjoy it so um, this is my presentation, uh, my story. So when the journey started, uh, the plan was to come up with guidelines for disclosure of um, TM. The TM is traditional medicine, otherwise I wouldn't have been able to fit everything in. <laughs> traditional medicine used for allopathic medicine practitioners by patients who use both traditional medicine and allopathic medicine. So this was uh, perspectives of 
uh, AMPs in Gauteng, South Africa. So this is what um, the presentation composes. Um, okay. So as an introduction, just a brief one. Um, in South Africa, um, traditional medicine is still a taboo, if I may say. Patients that opt to still go and consult with our allopathic medicine practitioners, not that they are not treated the same, but you would expect that before a patient is given the modern medicine, you find out if they are taking any other medicine because obviously there might be an interaction between the two. But this is not the case. So when we started, we wanted to find out why is it not happening? Why are they not disclosing? Are they being asked? How can we facilitate this? So the policies are there, but it's still an issue getting them to uh, work because the traditional medicine uh, practitioners are excited that the policies exist, but our allopathic medicine practitioners do not accept these policies. The purpose of the study, as I've uh, explained in the first slide, is to come up with guidelines uh, upon exploring um, the perceptions of our, of our allopathic medicine practitioners. Our research question was, what are the guidelines for disclosure of traditional medicine used to allopathic medicine practitioners by those patients who use both in Gauteng? So the methodology that was used was a um, qualitative exploratory descriptive uh, study in nature. Uh, Petronio's um, CPM theory, I'm not sure if there would be people that would be familiar with the CPM theory, which is a communication management uh, theory. It considers um, notions such as um, the fact that information like this is private to the patient. However, the doctors or the allopathic medicine practitioners still need to know, so they also they feel that they have the right to have this information so that they can work with the patient. Then we then have issues of uh, boundaries uh, being uh, disrespected or a confusion between the two. In-depth uh, interviews were used. We spoke to about uh, 14 uh, AMPs in three district hospitals in Gauteng. And Gauteng, not necessarily the largest province in South Africa, but the most densely populated because everyone that comes from other countries, they migrate there and hence um, the issues. And this is one of the issues. An interview guide was used, so we, the, the, inter, the interviews were semi-structured, so we had an interview guide, questions, but we probed um, during the process. Seven males took part, seven uh, females uh, were also involved. Only one participant was of um, Indian origin, and the other 13 were of black African origin. One participant had a postgraduate uh, qualification, and the rest only had uh, undergrad, which is um, an SA, it's a MBCHB, which is the medical degree. Then our key findings was that um, our participants thought that this topic was very contentious. Most of them, um, were not comfortable talking about it, or you could see in the way that they responded that um, 
they don't necessarily support the idea of patients using uh, traditional medicine. So also from that, you could see that combining the two treatment programs led, led to complications and increased healthcare costs because those patients that used both and that, um, or they started presenting with complications, but they were forced to be treated, but they are not saying uh, what is wrong with them. So all the tests have to be made to find out from blood tests what is wrong with the patient. So the allopathic medicine practitioners and the patient communication is important. So which was one of the key findings um, that was uh, 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 important for us to come up with the guidelines. So through those findings, most of the um, AMPs made recommendations on how to facilitate um, this disclosure process. And these are the guidelines that we came up with. So in these guidelines, uh, the first one, um, the implications is that it can allow us to integrate uh, THPs, so THPs are our traditional health practitioners, uh, the knowledge for the allopathic medicine practitioners, because one of the issues that we find out uh, during the um, interviews, the interviews is that most allopathic medicine practitioners have no knowledge of how this traditional medicine works. And then the second guideline developing effective communi uh, communication skills for allopathic medicine practitioners to interact with patients that use both these medication. Developing effective um, interventions for stigmatization through information and references from patients that use both traditional medicine and allopathic medicine. Stigma, of course, because if you go out uh, or to consult with an AMP and you disclose, sometimes you end up being treated differently. That's why some of these patients, even if they decide to disclose and get treated badly or the conversation changes, it's not what they were expecting, the next time they come back, they will not disclose if they do continue to use the traditional um, medicine. Incorporating uh, cultural responsiveness in the consultations of patients that use both traditional uh, medicine and um, allopathic medicine. The next guideline, developing proper support without prejudice for patients that use both traditional medicine and allopathic medicine. Maintaining disclosure through follow-up procedures. So like I said, um, it would be nice, it's very difficult in our hospitals for our patients to see the same doctor each time they come. Sometimes they uh, will come back and they are seeing a new doctor. They've had a good experience with the other one and now they see this other one who has a different attitude uh, towards their story and then the ball uh, uh, ends up being dropped also in there. The next guideline giving access to the information, uh, to, uh, to information and advice to inform choices between the two medication. And lastly, on that uh, guideline, advising on the patient's responsibility to comply with the prescribed allopathic treatment. Our stakeholders. So um, with the first guideline, we thought about or what came through uh, in the research is the policy makers at the Gauteng Department of Health. Uh, in the second guideline, hospitals in Gauteng need to be involved. The allopathic medicine practitioners and also the patients who use these medication to reach our final destination, which is patient disclosure. The implications for this research, 
Um, I'm hoping that uh, it can provide insight into far-reaching um, implications of disclosure guidelines as a means to foster communication between allopathic medicine practitioners and patients and consequently achieve better treatment outcomes. Greater institutional and government involvement that may trigger interest in existing traditional medicine uh, policies. As I've mentioned, we do have policies that exist. This information is invaluable in formulating policies and procedures for addressing the prevalence of non-disclosure by patients who use traditional medicine. Then uh, you may ask, how do I go back? The red? Okay. Where is the novelty in this research? Okay. So most importantly for me was in the process um, the information that I came out with using Petronio's um, communication privacy management theory helped me to comprehend disclosure to understand patients' decisions on non-disclosure. Unfortunately, I can't discuss all the notions that are involved within um, this theory uh, because it would have then made more sense uh, uh, for you how it came about for me to uh, use it. Again, based on the premise that patients' disclosure may uh, influence the current referral system from, from a, a one-way to a two-way system. What I mean by this is that the traditional health practitioners do refer patients to the allopathic medicine practitioners. However, the allopathic medicine practitioners almost never refer patients the other way. So quickly, um, I'm almost there. The limitations are that this study was only conducted in, conducted in Gauteng, South Africa, and I do believe that this is not only a problem there, probably a lot of places uh, all over the world are experiencing the same issues that we are facing. And that um, AMPs uh, or the doctors that participated uh, in this study were employed only in those district hospitals. So maybe the study, if the study can be extended to tertiary hospitals and uh, anywhere else, it would yield uh, some different uh, result or even more information. Several stakeholders um, whose information could have enriched the findings of the study, such as clinical managers, interns, the patients, and maybe the traditional health practitioners also were not included. Thank you. Any questions? Okay. Oh, oh, good. Mic's on. So um, we're out of time for this one. So if anyone has any questions for um, for the doctor, then you can put them in the app or um, absolutely meet up with her um, okay. outside the session. So thank you so much. Thank you. Much appreciated. So um, our final presenter today is um, Lilas Ali from, um, who'll be talking to us about the development of remote person. Thank you so much. Can I yep, the clicker should be up there for you. Hmm. Somehow these stands are always discriminating against short people. So I was hoping for like the mobile <laughs> microphone. Can I use this? Oh, I have to use this one. Can I use that one? And you can maybe turn this one off. Now, this one. Yeah, just away from the stand because the stand is always, yeah, like taking the entire scene. Okay, so now I see you and you see me. Thank you. Uh, yeah, well, my name is Leela Sali and I'm an associate professor at the University of Gothenburg. I come from a center called Center for Person-Centered Care, and we have a 
monitor downstairs on the first floor. And now I've said it, so all my colleagues are happy. Please come visit us. Uh, I'm here to tell you about a project that we have. And uh, in Sweden, we a couple of years ago, before the pandemic, the government said we have a vision. In 2025, we need to be the world leading in digital healthcare. And that was a very, very um, enthusiastic vision, and they put in a lot of effort into reaching this goal. But they started developing systems, and they started to see that the users are not using these systems or the, the, the tools that they have developed. So they started asking, what is, the, what is the problem? And then quite quickly, we could see that we need to involve the users in developing the, the systems because they know what they need and they can also see things that we think that we uh, know, but it shows that we don't. So in this project, uh, this is one of our patient uh, representatives, uh, Michaela Jovinger, and she said about participation, one of the Philip here, Philip times two, said that uh, we need to be involved more and the, the patient representative says that the staff should be more involved and more participated in, in, uh, in the engagement. So we're, this is what we are trying to strive for. So why did we do this? Uh, people who are diagnosed with COPD and heart failure have very, very severe symptoms. And they tend to isolate themselves because of these symptoms and they live in fear of death. They have high anxiety. And that's why we thought that we need to kind of develop a, a support to them and communication tool for them to gain support on top of the usual care. So in this picture is my colleague uh, Mahbube. She is a, a nurse and she has worked with person-centered care in the, in the wards and now she is in our project testing if we can see the same effect over distance that we can also get when we encounter people in, in real life. So the aim of this project was to, because we lack this end user system perspective, we need to involve them. And that's why we needed to develop this and also design it together co-create this digital tool together with the users. So we involved, uh, uh, a multi this is a multi-center control trial, and it was uh, in 2018 to 2020. So when the pandemic came, that was not a problem to us because the project was online and we have also uh, prepared to, to con just continue our research. So in total, we recruited 222 patients from nine primary care centers in Sweden, in our hometown in Gothenburg, and they were all diagnosed with CUPD and CHF. And uh, we uh, divided, so uh, randomized in two groups. So one group got this web support, and the other group had the usual care, and we compared the groups. So in person-centered care, we say that we need to uh, work together with the patient to see what kind of resources they have. Because why do you need to know what kind of resources you have? How do you recover without your resources? So if I'll take you to the um, lake and teach you how to fish, rather than fish for you. And this is the uh, main philosophy that we have. We need to start talking together, get to know who is it that I'm talking to and what kind of resources they have. So we measure the self-efficacy. What kind of trust do I have to myself that I can manage my illness? And this is uh, what we put the uh, focus on in our research. So I'll come back to the results what we could see, but we measured uh, after three months and after six months, and also after a year. So we worked together in what we called a participatory design and uh, iterative. 
back and forward. What do you think about these uh, functions in this uh, website? We need to develop a website, what kind of functions? And we try to strive for what the tacit knowledge. And the tacit knowledge, you can only gain the tacit knowledge when you are in a group and you're discussing. That's when the tacit knowledge comes. In another research project, we developed a calm room using VR for patients uh, who are admitted in one of our psychiatric inpatient wards. And I was testing this because we had created a really nice environment on the beach and there were birds and sun and everything. I said, this is perfect. And then one of our patient representatives, she, she was admitted for de uh, severe depression. She used the VR and I said in the end, okay, what did you think about it? And she said, it was okay, but can you just tell me why did the birds suicide? I was like, what? And then I was looking at it, yeah, the birds were going into the uh, sea, but they're not coming out. And that was something she discovered. <laughs> so it's really important to engage the uh, participants to get their view. And this is how we worked. We had workshops, and we were writing, and then we uh, made the idea become real. So here's another patient representative. This was during the pandemic. We could not meet, so we had a Zoom meeting, me and Birgitta. And this is what we did. We strived for all ages because uh, there has been a stigma that said that older people cannot use technology. And well, Birgitta, she was uh, better in technology than I was. So. And this is the result. It's called Min Helsa, My Health. It's in Swedish, but I just wanted you to see like an illustration of how the website is. Very easy to navigate. Here you have the menu and it's about uh, sending messages and then you can also uh, involve your uh, relatives if you want them to be involved. And the most important thing, the health, pa health plan, that when you, meet, when you talk to the nurse online, afterwards, she or the patient write the health plan themselves and upload it to the communication platform. And this is what they uh, write in the health plan. So today we have talked about what would you like to be able to do about the goals. To get there you have to, and this is the resources, capabilities or resources that could help you out are, and then we specify them even more, and what kind of support that they need from us or any other place. So this is agreed upon, an agreement, uploaded, and then the next time we have a conversation, we take the uh, health plan and we say, okay, this is what we discussed last time. Has anything changed? And then it's uploaded and you have an archive over the health plan, really easy to gain. And the heart there is when you, when you press the heart means that I agree, agree on this plan. And Mabubi said, why do I write the health plan? Maybe w the patients should write their own health plan. And she said, I'm going to test this. And now we have six, between 60 to 70 percent that write their own health plan. So when you just let go of the responsibility, sometimes you get really uh, good results. And this is also uh, that you gain information, you go to a website and there's information about the illness or if you want to join a, like Facebook, they have peer-to-peer -peer support. So we said, why do develop it? It's already there, you can go there. And then this is to, if, you, if I want my relatives to be able to uh, log into the system and read my health plan, you just invite them yourselves. So it's a lot of putting the responsibility on them. But as you said, from South Africa, there need to be a two-way communication. This is also something that they said. They want the two-way communication because they don't want to just log into a website and just keep logging and then no one would read it. It was really important that the professionals could also uh, kind of give some signals that they are involved in this. And also that they had some uh, comments about the layout and about the logging in. They had difficulties sometimes if they would forget the password. It's always this 
problem in the beginning, yeah. So we had to figure out a, an easy way to give them support. And also we discussed this with the nurses when we started the project, that your attitudes are really important. If you can show uh, it to the uh, new user, what kind of, uh, I mean, we can sort this, we can fix this. If you need anything, just tell me. And if you have that positive attitude, we see that this is also something that increases the, the use of the tool. But uh, uh, we couldn't see any changes after six months, but there was a change after three months. And we could also see that they had more phone calls in the beginning. After three months, not so many had. And it was all agreed upon what they wanted, their own individual preferences. It was not us saying that you need to have this and this, uh, how many phone calls. It was them. So to conclude this, we need to uh, engage them in, in uh, developing the website. And also, uh, what we can see the end user input is that it mirrored the increase in general self-efficacy. We could see that they uh, increased their, their trust in their ability to manage their disease. And this is also what we can see when we test person-centered care in real life. This is also uh, something that's always significant that we can't see the change in self-efficacy. So uh, PCC combined this platform and structured telephone support. It seems to be a good option to add upon usual care. And uh, I just want to give you also the time to, uh, it's in my last picture there. But uh, this is our website. And in our website, we have all our research that we have published, and we have also the material on how we have worked with the uh, different hospital settings in, in uh, implementing person-centered care in different healthcare settings. So uh, you're all welcome to talk to us in the monitor or just visit our website. So thank you. Thanks so much, Lilas. Does anyone have questions? We have um, just about a minute, so we can maybe take one question. Oh, I have a question then. Oh, absolutely. Um, I really appreciated your comment around the assumption that older adults can't use technology. And I'm wondering if you can just talk a little bit about how that came to you or how you, would, uh, how you adjusted for that sort of uh, assumption prejudice about older adults and technology. Uh, we have uh, yearly uh, annual reports in Sweden on how uh, our uh, inhabitants use the technology. And um, it's always stated that many elderly don't have, we have something called bank ID. Not many elder people have downloaded bank ID, not many elder people have uh, this and that. So uh, we tried to, uh, uh, how do you say, we tried to, well, I interviewed them. So I have a, a publication interviewing older people and the first one, Begita, she said, well, I started a Facebook group and, uh, and now we are 250 people in there and she was teaching me on, on things and then I just right after the first interview I said no I, I think that re annual report has missed something. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Uh, I do actually there's a question from the pool, um, from the pool and we have time. Thank you. Um, so I have been monitoring the poll and the questions, and um, I'm going to, with Chair's prerogative, we're going to pose one um, out of the mix. Um, and then I'm gonna, just going to give you a primer on some of the hidden functions of the app that you could or should be using um, to continue this conversation. So there's been, in the live Q&A, several questions that talk about diversity, inclusivity, how do you make sure that you're hearing from 
people, how do you build programs, get volunteers that reflect, you identified that, the Phillips. I love that we call you that now. For the next three days, you're gonna be the Phillips. Um, so I'm wondering, um, Emily and, and the Phillips, I'm wondering if you wanna kick us off in talking about strategies or your thinking around including, engaging, and in, uh, reflecting the populations that you that your programs and services might be using. Uh, you need to come up because for our live stream colleagues, um, they won't be able to hear you if you're speaking off mic. So the question is like, how do you um, get the diversity of, of, of a group? Um, I didn't, didn't got the chance to do that slide. Um, so in the, with the citizens platform, um, it was like a, a strategy that works is going in, in like circles. The first circle of people that you, you reach is not already the circle that you need in the platform. But through and through, I don't know if you call this in English, we, we say via via. Yes, okay. <laughs> that is like the way to go. I, um, I remember in another uh, region, they just made like a flyer. And yeah, it was really nice flyer, but there was nobody reacting on a flyer. You have to go to places where those people are. You have to be there. You have to continue to be there and not leaving a flyer, but like talking to people, getting to know them. Uh, the, you know, the foundation is like trust. They don't really, you know, how, how is it going to be there? Uh, it, what do I have to wear? What do, how people are going to address to me? You have to, all these little things you need, yeah, to address them. Um, so our strategy is like via via, is very important and going to places where those people are that you want to reach, um, and I think I will give it to you now. Thanks, Emily. Um, in our case, uh, I will speak for myself here. Um, I'm in a number of networks and a number of activities within and outside of Opgewekteen. So, as Emily said, yeah, the first thing you do is y you talk to people, you talk to people you know, you get on Facebook, uh, you, you get the message out. Um, and there's some people that I know that also had a difficult past that I that I was able to introduce to volunteering in that way, um, and then and then you then you follow up, you try to help uh, where necessary. But in other situations, I went I went door to door. <laughs> I mean, it's uh, anything is possible. We used flyers as well for other activities, and the response there was very very low. <laughs> but but that depends. Yeah. So there's yeah. Um, Multiple ways, I don't know if that's a uh, good answer. Yeah, maybe or just one. Um, a lot of uh, people um, from uh, other backgrounds have own self-organizations. Uh, and it's very important that you try to connect with them. In our own city, it's very difficult to find them because they're very informal a lot of the times connected with the church. So, um, yeah, it's good to start there and find some uh, people who trust the community. But most of all, uh, most of all, um, for us, they're just uh, members of the city, just citizens. So the talk we're now doing is very strange for me. <laughs> uh, just... Uh, try to get them involved and and listen to them and try to make other initiatives that are totally others that the one you are uh, making on that on the on the time now so so uh, try to find the uh, self organizations in your own community i think it's not so difficult to find them but it's to yeah how can they keep on coming that's the difficult point because the first time they will come and that's a very uh, important moment uh, if they're like okay i feel 
good here, then I will come again. But you have to do that again and again. So keeping them is the most difficult, I guess. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for that. We, unfortunately, we're out of, t don't pack up. Don't pack up. Thank you to all of our speakers. And I just want to flag that some of these comments um, were reflected in your talk, Richard, around sharing power to gain power, at least learning from the two-way dialogue. Unfortunately, we could spend all afternoon here, um, and we don't have time. A um, couple of things in the app. There's a discussion forum in the app attached to this session. You can continue the conversation there. Um, we've had a couple of shameless plugs. It's not shameless. We want to continue the conversation. 2.30, third sector, voluntary sector. 4 o'clock, presentation discussion of stigma. Please come to those. Um, it's really nice when we find our people and we have the ability to spend time together. You can actually search and communicate with particular speakers. So now that you know each other, you can find each other in the speakers list, and from there you can actually send messages. And then you can meet up for coffee and talk about things if you haven't had time. If your question wasn't addressed, you can find it there. So um, please explore the app. It is very useful and I think will help us enhance our conference experience. Vicki, any closing? No, she's good. Okay. So. The only thing between you and lunch is me, so I'm done. Stop. Thank you all. <laughs>